So yeah, I should say at the beginning, preface this talk with uh, saying that I'm coming at it from the C.S. Lewis angle. I've just finished a book about Lewis's Oxford, which looks at him as an academic, his academic career. But obviously it's a story that Tolkien plays quite an important part in. Um, and the bit of that story I want to talk about today relates specifically to um, the study of philology. And those of you who are familiar with Lewis's autobiography, Surprised by Joy, will know that in it he talks of his two-step conversion from uh, atheism to theism, and then to Christianity, um, a conversion that has a lot to do with the role of uh, Tolkien in his life. And this paper is going to look at a different uh, two-step conversion in Lewis's early life from a student of literae humaniores, the, the Oxford term for the study of the classics, to the School of English Language and Literature, and then subsequently to the embracing of the discipline of philology. Again, a two-step conversion has a lot to do with Tolkien and his influence on Lewis. And we know that Lewis was rather disdainful of philology in his early career because he records uh, his various sort of attempts to learn this subject in his diaries and his letters in the early 1920s. And so I'll draw a bit on that evidence, but also on some poems that I recently came across that Lewis composed during those uh, early years, 20s, uh, which again, I think, give us an insight into his views on this subject, and particularly the leading Oxford exponent of philology in those days, H.C. Wilde, the Merton professor uh, of the time. So it was in 1922 that Lewis began the English degree, having completed his degree in classics. It was the suggestion of his philosophy tutor, E.F. Carrot, that he thought as Lewis was looking around for an academic job, it would make him more employable if he also had English as well, uh, because it was a, a growing subject. There were more academic jobs in, in that. Um, and uh, coming from the more prestigious, or what he conceived to be the more prestigious school of literae humaniores, in which he'd already secured his double first, he was initially rather disparaging of the school and its, his fellow students. He complained about a certain amateurishness in the talk and look of the people. Apologies to those. I, mean, I can see some members of the English faculty here. Um, you know, things have changed since those days. Um, but his particular scorn was reserved for the philological component of the degree. As I said, he records this in his diaries that he kept during the 20s. And we can see the first signs of this lack of sympathy with the subject in his reflections on his old English tutorials which he had with Miss E. E. Wardale of St. Hugh's College, uh, who'd recently published her highly successful Grammar of Old English, which is, to be fair, a rather austere uh, <laughs> volume. Uh, Lewis wasn't particularly enamoured of her strongly philological approach, uh, finding her too concerned with phonology and linguistic theory. He says of it, delightful subjects, no doubt, but life is short. <laughs> But his, his low opinion of the subject was particularly extended to the lectures that he attended at the time, which were delivered by H.C. Wilde. Uh, having attended the series Outlines of the History of English, Lewis lamented the lack of new information thank you, on offer. So he says in his diary, Wilde spoke for an hour and told us nothing I haven't known these five years remarking language consists of sounds, not letters, and its growth did not depend on conscious changes by individuals, and that two and two make four, and other deep truths of that kind. Now, I've certainly given lectures of that kind myself, so I, I'm not going to criticise, but um, as well as the elementary nature of Wilde's approach, Lewis took particular exception to the way Wilde tended to harangue his audience, and it was this hectoring style that prompted Lewis to refer to him throughout his diary from then on as the cad. You know, rather old fashioned word meaning someone who's a bit of a bounder, uh, and not a gentleman. And it's to do with the way he, he interacted with his audience. So he had a tendency to complain if somebody came in late to draw attention to it. Uh, or if he thought they weren't concentrating properly, he'd pick on them. Um, or ask them questions and then... Um, complain if they didn't know the answer. You know, I'm not used to lecturing in this Sunday school kind of manner, he says of them. He also took an issue with his audience's use of fashionable, or what Wilde called super fine pronunciations, of words like waistcoat. He said, 
apparently you may pronounce it in that way, i.e. waistcoat, but I prefer the more gentlemanly pronunciation of Westcott. So, I mean, this is, this is a spelling pronunciation, so the word has changed its pronunciation over time to waistcoat, um, and it was clearly doing so at that point in the 1920s, and Wilde was objecting to the way his students had embraced this change. And he seems at this point to be contradicting his earlier claim that language change is subconscious, blaming these shifting pronunciations on the self-consciously fashionable usage of the younger generation, while attempting to curtail such developments by stubbornly holding on to his own old-school preferences. Driving Wilde's determination to preserve waistcoat over waistcoat are ideas of correctness and class that underpin many of his writings, despite his attempts to assert a scientific and disinterested approach to language study. So Wilde claimed in his published works that philology was an empirical science. This is, of course, very much the sort of, uh, the sort of founding um, the fathers of uh, philology, the 19th century um, uh, neo-grammarian's view of the subject, that it was a, a, an empirical science. The philologist observes and records variation in an impartial and dispassionate way. Uh, he says, we collect varieties in speech as an entomologist brings together different kinds of moth. We do not love the one and despise the other. We simply observe and compare them. But this stance of scientific objectivity found itself on slippery ground when Wilde tried to determine when dialect usage was acceptable and when it was not. So he says, the first thing to realise is that in itself, a provincial or regional dialect is just as respectable and historically quite as interesting as standard English. The next thing is to realise that if you want to speak good standard English, pronunciations which belong typically to a provincial dialect are out of place. It's probably wise and useful to get rid of these provincialisms since they attract attention and often ridicule in polite circles. This is from his book, Elementary Lessons in English Grammar. I suspect that's a, a, a statement that Tolkien would have disputed greatly. I mean, I thought it was interesting to see when we were in Exeter College Library yesterday that in the, the loans book, one of the things that Tolkien had taken out as a student was English was Joseph Wright's English dialect grammar. You know, so very, from a very early age, interested in dialect variation, whereas Wilde here seems to be suggesting that that's something that we should ignore or even get rid of. For Wilde, the 1920s were the high watermark of a distinguished career that began at Oxford, where he read philology under Henry Sweet, followed by a lectureship and then appointment to the Baines Chair of English Language at Liverpool University, returning to Oxford to take up the Merton Chair of English Language and Literature in 1920. And he'd written numerous influential textbooks on the subject. Um, his book, A History of Modern Colloquial English, published in 1920, was reprinted numerous times and really defined the uh, subject, that's the, his, the, sub, the study of the history of English, for the first half of the 20th century at least. Now Lewis's disapproval of Wilde and his teaching methods was not limited to these disparaging remarks in his diary. Uh, in his personal copy of Wilde's Short History of English, which was the textbook that he was using when he was studying the subject, he added a series of poems in which he engaged in a more comprehensive and uncompromising attack on Wilde's lecturing style and the hypocrisy of his approach to language change. So I'll just show you uh, what these all look like. So here's his copy um, of the short history of English. There's a poem there, you can probably just about make out that it's in Latin. I'll come back to the contents of these. Um, there's one here in English. Um, and then there's another one in English in the form of an acrostic. If you could sort of see that you, if you read down the sides there, you can see he spells out Henry Cecil Wilde, he. Um, and then the next page has one in Old English, one in Greek, and one in French. 
Uh, so, you know, he, he really had a lot to say about Wilde in a number of different languages. Um, let me just give you a taste of this. Um, so here's, here's one of the English ones. This is the, um, uh, the, uh, the acrostic. Loud mouth. Oh, no, sorry, that's the first one. He opens and closes his glottis at pleasure. Explosives and stops he is able to measure. No grunt and no gurgle escapes his attention religiously marking each slackness and tension. You find him in airbursts beguiling his leisure. This is the idea that he's only interested in phonetics, the, the production of sounds. Can anyone blame him if doomed to mistaking each word in its meaning? He studies the making. He's not interested in the meanings of words. Condemned to be blind to the picture, the frame instead let him chip out. So he, doesn't, he can't see texts as texts, only he's only interested in the making of them. But why, in God's name, lead us from Parnassus to join your <laughs> muckraking? Why, pray, should a squire of the muse and Apollo yield thus with a living steam organ to follow? Leave us to the spirit and keep your phonetics. Don't come to the table to talk dietetics. <laughs> and then it goes on. Uh, His Berkshire garden grows, I'm told, enormous marrows tinged with gold. And then, regrettably, it just stops at that point, and we never find out what it is about his marrows that Lewis is so uh, objects to. But that gives you the tone of of all of these. It's it's a complaint about this obsessive interest in the production of sounds and nothing to do with their meanings. Texts become, for a while, just something that you can study from a purely phonetic perspective. Um, And just because I can't resist it. Uh, the, the Old English one, um, which for those of you who studied some Old English might recognise. I mean, this is Lewis. He's just started studying Old English. So it seems kind of, you know, sort of somewhat impressive that he's already composing poems in it. Um, but it, it, these are, this is sort of a tissue of quotations, particularly from the Old English poem Judith. And there's a bit of Beowulf there um, uh, as well. Um, it, it translates like this. The worst of teachers, a tyrant. Henry was the hard-tongued man called. Wilde was called an enemy to humans, awe-inspiring leader of men in Oxford. Often he laughed and roared and clamoured and made noises after Wilde, hateful to the saviour. Bloodthirsty man, occupied the learning hall. Wicked scholar, mocked each of them all. His belly was wider than that of any man. (laughs) And it's interesting that... um, Looking at the poems, I mean, I think you can see this visually, but I I called upon the expert in this field, uh, a man called Charlie Starr, who has spent a lot of time studying datable specimens of Lewis's handwriting so that you can see, I think visually, that there's something different between this very leftward-leaning script of this first of the poems and then this sort of style of script. And he suggests that they were written between 1922, when Lewis started studying it, and really towards the end of the 20s, which suggests, rather than him sort of sitting in the lecture, writing them all, despairing of Wilde, that he was actually coming back to this book and adding them as more ideas came to him. And it, it became a sort of, um, yeah, something, even after he'd actually started teaching in the English faculty in, in, in 1925. So that by this stage, Wilde is, you know, technically a colleague. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so yeah, those, that's the poems. Um, Lewis's experience of being lectured at by Wilde fostered a suspicion of and hostility towards philology that continued into the early years of his appointment as a member of the English faculty. Tolkien seems to have been more positively disposed towards Wilde. When he mentions Wilde's sudden death in January 1945 in a letter to Christopher, he adds, God rest his soul. Wilde's unexpected demise did, however, create a degree of inconvenience for Tolkien. In a letter to Stanley Unwin in March of that year, he laments that finding Wilde's successor in the Merton chair would inevitably devolve onto him, and thereby taking up much of the vacation, which he was hoping to do some writing. And in the end, of course, Tolkien's fear that the responsibility of replacing Wilde would fall upon him was truer than he realised, since, of course, he was elected his successor. And that Wilde and Tolkien were more than just colleagues is suggested by an anecdote that Tolkien recounts in his valedictory lecture, where he recalls witnessing Wilde wreck a table in Oxford's Cadena Cafe with the vigour of his representation of Finnish minstrels chanting the Kalevala. 
it's an interesting kind of uh, moment. Tolkien and Wilde would no doubt have disagreed about the correct pronunciation of waistcoat. However, since Tolkien placed the waistcoat pronunciation in the speech of Gaffer Gamgee, hardly the kind of gentleman with whom Wilde associated it. And that, in fact, fits with the OED's labelling of the waistcoat form, which it says is, rep is found in representations of vulgar pronunciation. So that's the OED label, vulgar, uh, meaning popular, really. Um, and since the word begins with W, and the entry was published in 1921, at the very time that Tolkien was there working at the OED on the W words, you know, walrus and so on, um, he may even have written it, who knows. Um, it was Tolkien's friendship with Lewis, though, that was to challenge and finally overcome Lewis's antipathy towards this purely linguistic approach to the study of Old and Middle English texts. Lewis's famous account of their first encounter at a meeting of the English faculty in 1926, indicates that while he found his new colleague genial and approachable, they clashed over the importance of philology for literary studies. So Lewis noted Tolkien's view that language is the real thing in the school, and that Tolkien was unable to read Spencer, a poem, poet to whom Lewis was devoted, because of the forms. So that's a reference to the artificial and archaic diction which Spencer wrote in. And it's presumably for that reason that Lewis summed up his initial assessment of Tolkien with no harm in him, only needs a smack or so. Reflecting on their friendship in Surprise by Joy, Lewis recalls how when he first arrived at the English faculty, he had been explicitly warned never to trust a philologist, uh, but that his, it was his friendship with Tolkien that had led him to overcome that prejudice. Having established himself in Oxford following his appointment to the Rawlinson and Bosworth Chair of Anglo-Saxon in 1925, Tolkien set out his approach to philology and its role in the English syllabus in an essay titled The Oxford English School, published in the Oxford Magazine in 1930. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. The deep division that Tolkien encountered in the English school in Oxford had its origins in the initial proposals for its foundation. Despite a determination that there should be a balance between language and literature in the syllabus that was first devised in 1898 in order to prevent division between the school. In fact, only one of the papers that were set for examination that year attempted to combine the two approaches. But rather than seeking to encourage students to apply both approaches to works by Chaucer and um, William Lang and Piers Plowman, the examination paper that did try and include questions on both literature and language included six literary questions and then six language questions. So there was no attempt to try and unite these two approaches. And DJ Palmer, who's written an account of the rise of English studies as a discipline, says that this epitomized the artificial and mechanical balance between the two sides of the school and the failure to reconcile them properly. So accepting that the distinction between philology and literature was notoriously marked, as he calls it, in the Oxford School, Tolkien argued that the division was not helped by the use of the terms language and literature, and he preferred instead to use the letters A and B. The A course focused on literary, historical, critical and linguistic studies of Old and Middle English texts, uh, and central to this was philology. Tolkien proposed revising the B course by jettisoning 19th century literature altogether and substituting it with the rigorous study of Old and Middle English texts. And so that would then replace the meagre philology, as he called it, and uh, for those uh, on offer for the B course and offer them real philology. Tolkien viewed the discipline of philology as central to the study of all the northern tongues. Without it, Old English poetry the Gothic translation of the Bible, the old Icelandic sagas could not be read at all. And it was therefore essential to the critical toolkit wielded by student and scholar. So he says the poems and prose they study, the senses of their words, their syntax, their idiom, meter and illusion were rescued from oblivion by philologists. And so he placed philology at the core 
of his proposed revisions of the Oxford syllabus. And rather than attempting to find a kind of half-hearted compromise between these two narrowly focused modes of language and literature, he pro proposed this broader third way, a more comprehensive approach that had philology at its heart. Underpinning Tolkien's proposal was the belief that language is more important than any of its functions, um, and only one of those functions was the literary language, and therefore literature was a kind of sub, um, subdivision of language. Engaging with language, therefore, became profound and fundamental to the subject. And it was the following year that he read his paper to the Philological Society, which analysed the northern dialect in Chaucer's Reeves' tale. And in arguing here that Chaucer was accurate in his depiction of northern dialect, Tolkien recruited Chaucer, the poet, the father of English literature, to the language side of the debate. He begins sort of provocatively by claiming that uh, Chaucer would have preferred the company of the Philological Society to that of the Royal Society of Literature. I mean, of course, he was giving the paper to the Philological Society. Um, <laughs> And the title of the paper, as it appeared in the Society's Transactions in 1934, is even more explicit in its association with Chaucer, of Chaucer with Tolkien's linguistic cause. He called it Chaucer as a philologist. And Jill Fitzgerald has noticed the significance of this appropriation of Chaucer, since his works have traditionally straddled the borderline between literary and linguistic approaches. You know, so we can see studying Sir Gowan in the Green Knight is traditionally language, uh, whereas Chaucer is traditionally literature, even though they're contemporaries. It's to do with the, 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 the supposed difficulty of studying their language, I think. So Tolkien's recruiting of Chaucer to philology was a deliberate attempt to stake a claim for the works of a canonical writer, traditionally felt to belong more in the literary camp. It's indicative, then, I think, of the influence that Tolkien was to have over Lewis, that Lewis came to support Tolkien's proposed syllabus with its focus on philology and the study of Old and Middle English language. The extent of the hostility that was sparked by this conspiratorial plotting is apparent from Lewis's warning to Tolkien to be on his guard when discussing these plans amongst colleagues. Forgive me, he says, if I remind you that there are disguised orcs behind every tree. Their combined efforts were successful in moulding a new syllabus in 1931 along the lines that Tolkien had set out, requiring all students to engage in detailed study of the language of medieval English texts. And Lewis described their victory to his brother Warren as a great feather in my cap, and that he characterised their success as having forced the new syllabus on the junto after much hard fighting. And in his diary, Tolkien privately admitted that the reform syllabus went beyond his wildest hopes. The question of the balance of the language and literature components of the Oxford English syllabus came up for reconsideration again in the early 1950s, and a subcommittee was tasked with devising proposals to be voted on by a full meeting of the faculty. Tolkien, now the Merton professor, as we've seen, was a member of this working party which came up with a proposal to restore Victorian literature and even make a foray into the 20th century. Lewis was incensed at Tolkien's decision to turn against the syllabus that the two of them had originally devised. His scorn for the new proposals is apparent from a poem that he wrote and submitted to the editor of the Oxford magazine titled Ichabod, uh, which means the glory has departed. The poem ruefully records how the march of progress has compelled the English school to pare down the Middle Ages, to prune Bowery Spencer to a leafless stick, and fob off Milton with the same share as once fell to Hockleaf, Hunt and Blair. Small is the loss, he says. Their works are out of touch with life, i.e. not read at Cambridge much. But the poem was never published because... Uh, Lewis's vigorous campaigning and passionate oratory prompted the majority of the faculty members to reject the new syllabus. Even Tolkien was persuaded to vote against the very proposals he himself had contributed to devising. 
That scornful reference to the Cambridge English School, with its implication of its relative inferiority, is of course ironic since in 1954, just a couple of years later, Lewis took up the newly established Chair of Medieval and Renaissance Studies at Cambridge University. In switching to the Cambridge English School, Lewis found himself in a department with little interest in formal language study. And it's at Cambridge that Lewis appears to have ended his long-standing spat with Wilde and philology, only to encounter a new foe in the form of F.R. Leavis and the study of what Lewis referred to scornfully as literary criticism with the largest possible capitals for both words. But that's another story. Thank you. Thank you.